I'll be. I, that's fine. I'll be brief. Uh, um, I'm, jo I'm Jonathan Inver. I've taught at Wellesley College for 35 years, and by the end of this talk, I'll be referring to my own college as a laboratory of the etiquette of pluralism. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, sociology has a long tradition as Peter Berger's work has represented for many years a long tradition of interest in religion. In fact, uh, I think it's impossible to argue that the very origins of sociology and Comte and Spencer and, e and Marx and others, they were all preoccupied in one way or another with religion. In the many altars of modernity, uh, Peter refers to Robert and Helen Lynn's studies of Middletown in the 1920s and 30s to illustrate how unquestioned certainty is both the lowest and deepest level of the taken for grantedness of one's social reality. Where, for example, uh, that he gives, asking a woman who is married if she is married to a man would have struck such a woman at that time as a puzzling, if not irritating, question. He then provides a contemporary anecdote about the confusion created today when a woman introduced her partner to Peter's wife, Brigida, who mistakenly assumed that partner meant something more akin to business or law partner rather than spouse. The foundation for these types of confusion is an important place to begin to understand the new paradigm and what I uh, will be referring to as the etiquette of pluralism. And, uh, that Peter proposes. I'd like in these brief remarks to expand upon that foundation, the multiple realities perspective of Alfred Schutz, by revisiting the now what I call holy trinity of sociology, race, class, and gender. I may say with Schutzian certainty that of course by my referring to it as a holy trinity, I intend to upend a bit the taken for grantedness of the ideological force now contained in the terms race, class, and gender, as they have drifted far from the, their demographically derived meanings. I've taken the title for my remarks from a source that may not impress you as immediately relevant to a discussion of pluralism or of the relationships between secularization or secularity, religion, and modernity but I will endeavor to propose that these latter macro phenomena and processes reflect micro processes of consciousness and behavior and that a sociological approach assists in making the connection. So I take the title of my remarks from a book published in 1937 entitled The Etiquette of Race Relations in the South, a study in social control by a sociologist named Bertram Wilbur Doyle, an African American and a student and colleague of Robert Park at the University of Chicago at the time and who taught at Fisk University. He was also presiding bishop of the Seventh Episcopal District for the Methodist Episcopal Church in Nashville, Tennessee, the African American branch of Methodism. Doyle attributes the importance of the study of etiquette in the history of sociology to Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner, both lesser but I would argue no less significant figures in that history than Marx, Weber, or Durkheim. Spencer, Doyle tells us, remarked on the importance of etiquette and social ritual as a form of government or social control and indeed as a subject for sociological investigation. And Doyle further observes the failure of reconstruction that is after the Civil War, the failure of Reconstruction legislation to affect any fundamental change in the South's caste system is less an illustration of the recalcitrance of the Anglo-Saxon than of Sumner's dictum that it is not possible to reform the mores by law. Etiquette, Doyle argues, is concerned primarily with personal relations. It grows up in the first instance perhaps as a spontaneous expression of one person in the presence of another, of a sentiment of deference. Etiquette accomplishes a great deal in social relations. It conceals more than reveals emotions. It defines and maintains social distances. 
and Doyle concludes, thus etiquette turns out to be at the same time a principle of social order and an index of the stability of the society in which it exists. The etiquette of race relations reveals a fascinating convergence of a racial code at the same time uh, competing with evidence of its historical demise, as much an example of multiple realities as a prioritizing of those realities. I want to explore the Schutzian, the Schutzian claims about these realities as both consciousness claims and historical claims. Doyle illustrates this well with an, an, uh, 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 an account he gives about Booker T. Washington. Now I'm quoting from Doyle. Uh, it's a, a bit long. So Doyle writes, one of the methods adopted by Washington to sp uh, spread his gospel of education was to organize from time to time statewide educational campaigns. On such occasions, he and his party traveled sometimes for a week in a special car, visiting and speaking in every city and center of Negro population. On these occasions, he was frequently visited by delegations of white folk from remote villages along the way who, attracted by the legendary reputation he had achieved, wanted to see this extraordinary man. Southern white people have always been interested in Negro prodigies. On one of these occasions, a delegation headed by a lanky and rustic but enterprising member of the village intelligentsia waited upon Mr. Washington at the station and introduced himself and his fellow villagers in good-natured backwoods fashion. And uh, then Doyle quotes, You know, Booker, I've been hearing about you. I've been hearing for a long time now, and I sure did want to see you. I've been telling my friends about you. I've, I've been telling them you was one of the biggest men in this country today. Yes, sir, one of the biggest men in the, white, in the whole country. At this time, Theodore Roosevelt was at the height of his reputation, and Mr. Washington, somewhat at a loss for a reply, but thinking it well to discount the exuberance of his visitor, replied, well, what do you think about President Roosevelt? And uh, the fellow replies, oh, hell, Roosevelt? Well, I used to be all for him until he let you eat dinner with him. That finished him as far as I'm concerned. This retort was not perhaps as naive. This is still Doyle talking. This retort was not perhaps as naive as it may first appear, but it illustrates at any rate the curious and incongruous association of ideas and attitudes that arise out of the necessity of maintaining the customary caste distinctions in a world which is gradually outgrowing them. That's the end of the Doyle quote. The account from which I have just quoted at length moves us beyond George Herbert Mead's formulation of the generalized other. Mead's concept, as Silky Steets ably recounts in her important essay on multiple realities in religion, a sociological approach, which I may say was published in the magazine Society, approaches a way of envisioning primary socialization from what we might call now an evolutionary psychology perspective, another way of making claims about particular universal forms of human nature. Mead's theory elides historical circumstances as the constant joining of consciousness with the larger social reality in which all consciousness resides. As I will try to address with other examples, what Doyle recognized was the developing recognition of the color line as a particular way of understanding the nature of the established social order. The intervention of history suggests to me a similar challenge to the phenomenological notion of paramount reality. The historical circumstances in which we all find ourselves in everyday life do not undermine that reality so much as they reveal a fascinating tension between Schutz's idea of the natural attitude and Doyle's account of the surrounding mixture of custom, deference, and caste, or in other words, Sumner's mores. For Doyle, the slow dissolution of the racial caste mores was achieved by a simultaneous acknowledgement of the etiquette and a doubt about its continued efficacy in maintaining the customs it was designed to reinforce. The magic, as it were, of this simultaneous process appears in what W.E.B. Du Bois called the double consciousness, a way of linking his historical critique of America's dust, what he called its dusty desert of dollars and smartness with uh, 
For, in, for example, uh, although he didn't, uh, Du Bois didn't make the association, I'm making it, uh, Max Weber's Iron Cage, which Weber intoned at the close of the Protestant ethic, d departing, as some critics have observed, from his otherwise paramount methodology of disinterest. Du Bois' double consciousness, which he refers to in The Souls of Black Folk, is the generalized other saturated and marinated in history. And we may temporize about its significance or dismiss it or glorify it, but these are all judgments that emanate from the power of the mores to determine beyond law and often beyond reason the judgments of men and women. Modernization and its antecedents are social forces that link consciousness with clarities and confusions. Because modernization is so closely tied to both secularization and scientific and technical advance, the social phenomenon of religion, that is what people call religion and religiosity, looks something akin to caste when viewed by those who equate religion to false consciousness. Let me illustrate uh, the psychological problem. Now I'm shifting away from race uh, to the second of the Holy Trinity to class. We owe much to Karl Marx, in particular to On the Jewish Question, for the denial of a pluralistic view of religion and modernity. In place of what I consider a natural ambiguity that arises whenever religious practice encounters the paramount reality of everyday life, Marx and Engels famously concluded, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And thinking of Doyle, it is no coincidence that the first adver adversarial pairing referred to in those struggles in the Communist Manifesto is between free man and slave. I've been taught to read the f the f this first great line of the first chapter of the Communist Manifesto as either the most profound historical generalization ever written or the most paranoid. In strictly secular terms, Marx's theory represents a complete rejection of pluralism both in history and in consciousness. But in the case of consciousness, the etiquette of class relations prevents most of us from even harboring the wish for a wholesale elimination of the 1%, despite the wailings of sociologists who long ago transubstantiated stratification into inequality, turning disinterest into injustice. Doyle's etiquette of race relations did not claim that etiquette was fixed for all time between the races that in fact precisely because free men and slaves interacted personally, in many cases over a long period of time, the emergence of an awareness of their common humanity was unavoidable. The emancipation of the slaves, as Doyle recounts, was most common among slaveholders who knew their slaves personally. These personal relations were not enough to forestall a civil war any more than religious belief today can be so defined or contained to prevent the advocacy of violence in its name. A question that pertains to the changing etiquette of race relations is whether such an etiquette exhibits newer expressions of social control, say in the claims made uh, about racial profiling. Yet in the case of the etiquette of what I'm calling the etiquette of class relations, a shared humanity is promised in the, first of all in the franchise and democratic participation. The further left one goes, the greater the criticism of the effectiveness and reality of such participation. The further right one goes, the more the defense of meritocracy has come to stand, for, stand in for a justification of the perceived inevitability of social stratification. These differences seem inscribed in what we call politics, but most people live well below the threshold of holding their political opinions in ways that are premonitions of civil war. Unlike contemporary uses of race and gender to promote social conflict, class conflict, say in the form of the mostly deceased Occupy Wall Street movement, was part carnival and part anarchist-driven display of a theater of remissive protests that sought the only currency available to it short of premeditated violence, that is, the media's willingness to pay attention to it by reporting uh, its otherwise peaceful activities nationally. Apart from that attention, social stratification is part of the pluralism of class relations, not only between different social classes, but within them as well. American pluralism in its religious traditions and denominations, as Peter uh, 
uh, points out, displays an especially vigorous character of toleration. I would argue that a powerful etiquette of class relations endures precisely because of an already underlying foundation of religious toleration. Berger's uh, argument goes further, uh, requiring that we acknowledge certain processes of modernization that render faith commitments as voluntary commitments, changing the nature of the authority of religious institutions. At the same time, those in authority in many domains other than strictly religious ones, including the academic domain with which I'm most familiar, are faced with consumers who've, whose voluntary participation, or as economists like to say, their willingness to pay, play a vital role in the destiny of all institutions in the modern world. Before I address more directly the concept of pluralism and the etiquette that shapes it, I want to explore the last in this holy trinity of sociology, gender and its vicissitudes. The biological categories of sex have social expressions that have long been the staple of uh, gender studies. Like race and class, gender is analyzed from already well-established ideological frames that define identity in very specific ways. The emergence of transgender identity works first to challenge the way language about such identity is used. But so far as I know, being a woman and wanting to identify as a man, or being a man and wanting to identify as a woman, has not led to those born as male or as female to wish to be other than one or the other, a third sex as it were. There is, at least at this time, no third sex. That is to say, nature has, with minuscule exception, determined us to be chromosomally designed under two categories that transgenderism works between. It is true that the color line historically created situations in which passing as white followed a similar dynamic at work in transgenderism. The taken for grantedness of race as a social, if not genetic, category remains. What is referred to as identity politics has one of its sources in how identity in any of its primary forms interacts with a now global stock of knowledge about the multiple but clearly not infinite forms of identity available. In another sense, the etiquette of gender relations does not open upon an unlimited form of expressions of identity. In fact, boundaries have been lately powerfully reinforced by af affirmations of one social institution in particular, the institution of marriage, that in its conservative and conserving nature now incorporates same-sex couples equal in the marriage status to heterosexual couples. I'm of the conviction that identity politics, which encompasses both race and gender politics especially, is an artifact of modernity. It has become deeply entrenched in the secular worldview of higher education elites because it promises to expose both the constraints and broader possibilities of modernity itself. This takes me to an account and assessment of Peter's two pluralisms. I quote from the many altars of modernity. We've heard this this morning, but it's, it's, it's a, a very basic thematic of what we're discussing here, so I'll quote again from it. Uh, if one is to understand the place of religion in the pluralist phenomenon, one must note that there are two pluralisms in evidence here. The first is the pluralism of different religious options coexisting in the same society. The second is the pluralism of the secular discourse and various religious discourses also coexisting in the same society. For the faith of individuals, the implication of this is simple and exceedingly important. For most religious believers, faith and secularity are not mutually exclusive modes of attending to reality. It is not a matter of either or, but rather both and. The ability to handle different discourses, to use Schutz's term, different relevance structures, is an essential trait of a modern person. My laboratory, if I may call it that, is the institutional system of higher education, in my specific case, a decidedly post-Protestant place which is to say a school whose chaplain is instead called the dean of religious and spiritual life. This latter title does not sound secular at all, and its mandate evolved from its original form of Protestant chaplain to a pluralist and less religiously specific designation of dean, a term once infused with religious meaning from medieval monasteries to its uses in universities entirely run by clerics. Dean is now a secular bureaucratic category. 
The dean of religious and spiritual life is charged with overseeing what Berger defines as the first of the two pluralisms, that is, different religious options existing in this case at the same college, uh, a society writ small. In fact, the etiquette of pluralism in this case is reinforced precisely by a secular mandate that there cannot be in this kind of liberal arts college only one faith represented, and further that it is essential that no student of any faith tradition be precluded from being represented in the multi-faith model itself. Some years, even Wicca has a voice. Paganism is part of the multicultural dispensation, dovetailing, I would argue, with identity politics. What I am calling here the etiquette of pluralism exemplifies a form of social control that seeks to honor multiple revelations while privileging none. The second pluralism is sociologically more complicated because the historical reality that flows through the evolution from chaplain to dean cannot be immediately explained by a process of secularization. On the contrary, my institution acknowledges clearly the importance of the faith traditions of the life of the college uh, to the life of the college. There is no mandatory chapel, however, or Bible requirement, as once was the case until the late 1960s. I think even Hillary Clinton had to take the Bible requirement. But the faculty have argued for decades about a multicultural requirement, which insists that students know something about a culture other than their own. This by now rather quaint argument does implicate a certain kind of faith that the more liberal churches and synagogues have embraced. I wonder if it confirms the coexisting nature of the pluralism Berger describes as the both and type. What is finally interesting to me is how much faith and secularity now mutually reinforce each other. Yet the so-called culture wars have created the impression that when it comes to religion, only fundamentalists represent religion, and when it comes to the secular, only atheists represent secularity. What Peter Berger has faithfully, faithfully enabled us to see is that the new paradigm calls for a sustained empirical effort to understand how modernity, despite the radical poles within it, is pushing all of us in the direction of making peace with the enduring presence of both religion and secularity in human life. Thank you. Uh, allegedly. So it, uh, it began uh, with an argument uh, that the college population uh, was lar largely of one faith, one race, uh, not necessarily one political point of view, but uh, enough so in, in proportion that uh, the argument was that they needed to learn more about other cultures. And in fact, the very first arguments about the multicultural requirement were all about whether students should be obliged to learn about what was called the history of racism in the country. That was soundly defeated in the college back in the 1980s, not because most faculty disagreed with what they thought might be important to learn about the history of racism, but that it had a real impact on uh, how such a course would be developed and what it would take away from certain departments who might not get to participate in uh, uh, providing faculty for the teaching of it. So it, it got enmeshed in bureaucratic wranglings uh, and it, it became an elective uh, matter. What, rather than a required course, students could choose a course uh, from a list. And that didn't last uh, for more than five or six years until uh, it was uh, determined that there were, uh, the list did not necessarily uh, provide as many options as there were students that needed to learn something other than their own culture. So it became even more elective in the sense that they could sign up for any course and uh, a faculty member or dean could indicate that it fulfilled the multicultural requirement. Uh, I think they call that watering it down. But uh, the, the argument I was trying to make was that uh, it was 
an effort on the part uh, of both administrators and certain faculty to reintroduce uh, something that had existed in bureaucratic form uh, like the Bible requirement. What students had to take a, a semester of Old Testament and New Testament up until the late 1960s when they abolished it uh, as a requirement. Uh, it decentered the religion department at Wellesley uh, in, in profound ways in terms of enrollment. And I, uh, I, I did research on this years ago because I used it as an argument against the multicultural requirement. Uh, I, I was against the reimposition of something that every student had to know. Uh, Eliot at Harvard in the late 19th century introduced the elective system, and uh, we have distribution requirements. You need to take a course in art. And thing. In other words, there, there, there is some uh, uh, argument uh, for breadth, but uh, I was against the argument for insisting that they all have to take one course. That's where that all comes from. Yes. The first thing I would say is that it, it definitely speaks to a breakdown in the etiquette of pluralism I was trying to argue for. Um, look, uh, to me, uh, that particular issue, that particular incident, uh, the pressure that uh, has been uh, uh, galvanized uh, in reaction uh, to those state legislatures passing uh, their Religious Liberty Acts. It reminds me uh, of the kinds of conflagrations that uh, um, now almost a generation ago uh, were being described as a culture war, as part of the culture war. And I'm not convinced uh, that we're in the same place uh, about the culture wars that we were then because they had much more political traction then. Uh, what seems to be the case here is, is, is that some of this is going to be worked out in the courts and some of it is going to be worked out more quietly in uh, people's un, uh, understanding of who's being affected in what ways. So I, I, don't, ha I don't have an answer uh, specifically to, to thinking about how that gets resolved. But by analogy, I, I, I do think that there's a, uh, a lot to have learned uh, from, the way that I for, from the way that I formulated uh, a notion of etiquette, that uh, we have a legal system that, that uh, rather, th and we complement that system by and large with helping us settle uh, uh, disagreements and disputes. The mobbing that went on, uh, is indicative of a, of a way in which the social media now operates uh, to inform people about what's going on. So I, I, uh, by analogy, I'll give you m my uh, interpretation of reactions, say, to events in Ferguson and to events um, even more recently, uh, the way that it gets picked up in social media and uh, uh, then comes to the college campus. 
and I've had uh, numerous conversations with students who uh, find it relatively easy to go out in the quad and, and raise up posters and uh, protest. And then I asked them, what do they know about the legal system in which these things operate? What can they do that's more effective than just voicing protest? And that, that's where I put a lot of this. Does it have real consequences for uh, certain people in certain businesses? There's no question about that. But it strikes me that uh, it's going to be uh, uh, long term dealt with at the level of personal relations, people who know each other and, uh, and dealt with in, in those terms. And that, that's the origins of the reduction of conflict generally. Oh, yeah. Um, who rabble-rouse and spoke in very nice um, the Muslim community. And he was saying yesterday um, that his major opponent, the same Sheik, forced him to marry his major sister. And he produced um, the thing, produced her marriage proposal, um, and said that she was, was a Christian. She was Christian, right? But she wasn't forced into marriage because her parents consented to do so. And there's been thousands of people, there's been thousands of people. Applauding him and supporting him and saying that this is a marvelous thing. And this is a person who has his roots on the very left of the Labour Party. Um, and yet he is embracing the sort of uh, patriarchal aspect uh, in the name of the left. What, what happens when these two these two epithets come into conflict? And is that going to be something that can affect the position? What, what, what aspect of it of the Etiquette, are you saying well, it's related to religion? Well, because <laughs> the fundamental conflict is over Islam, basically. Um, because Islam is, on the one hand, the religion of people who are regarded as their pure racial racial minorities in the world. Um, and the, their basic claims are in extraordinary tension with the basic claims of feminism and gender rights and things like that. And that's a huge problem. The left, for many reasons, not least because the left, quite often in politics, represents these constituencies that have large numbers of professional women and also large numbers of ethnic minorities and religious. So, so two forms of two forms of etiquette, as well as a lot of other things. What are your thoughts? I'm I'm not sure how to answer that. I. I what I, would, what I was thinking in the context of talking about the etiquette of race relations, the etiquette of uh, class and gender relations, is that uh, something that we generally refer to in the United States as civil society, and that it owes its formation and maintenance uh, to, to two distinct phenomena. What, one is the role that religion has played historically in American life, and the other is that uh, it, 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 civil society insists on people having familiarity with each other, knowing something about each other. And that, that can be uh, at, at a variety of levels of, of familiarity, from, from friendship to uh, s different kinds of civic engagement, be belonging to clubs. Belong In other words, uh, I was, tr I was trying to lay out uh, the fact that historically these etiquettes are not fixed in time, but that they remain uh, viable precisely because uh, uh, we, we all have expectations about certain boundaries uh, that enable us to get along. And that's, that's why I emphasize the fact that uh, et etiquette doesn't mean you have to know someone well. But it, in order to trust them uh, without knowing them well, we have uh, mutual expectations of how we're going to treat each other. And uh, that's part of, uh, that, uh, I would 
think in a phenomenological sense, that's part of the life world. But it's a life world that I was trying to make more explicit in terms of its historicity, so, so that uh, Doyle's life world that revolved around the color line uh, uh, was being challenged simply uh, by Doyle's effort to understand it. Yeah, I, and as I said before, uh, I think that the, the characteristic way that that uh, emerged in sociological literature would be, for instance, James Davis and Hunter's book on the culture wars. But I'm, I'm not persuaded as much as I used to be that that, that frame necessarily uh, explains everything th that has developed along those lines. That, that, that for instance, uh, It is important to recognize that there are uh, forces, obviously from a political standpoint, lar largely from uh, a more radical perspective uh, that, and I said this, I tried to say it here, that, that view religion uh, in the same way that uh, Doyle describes caste. That is, that view, views it as uh, entrenched in worldviews that are being supplanted and surpassed uh, by these new forces. And uh, we've had a, a, a remarkable pluralism within our own society that has uh, dealt with that in the mores for a very long time so, so that uh, we've, we don't persecute homosexuals anymore. So, uh, and uh, I imagine that there's very few in the religious traditions, as we understand them today, that would advocate that. Uh, but it used to be a, 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 a matter of state. Uh, uh, and so I guess that's what I was trying to say, that the etiquette about it has evolved. I understand uh, both the questions about the, uh, the turning of uh, religious conviction into bigotry and uh, wouldn't wouldn't sanction that interpretation for uh, a millisecond. Uh, at the same t yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just, it, it, seems, it seems to me that uh, the more 
But I wonder if uh, Peter would argue that uh, those particular kinds of issues you've just described come from aspects of religious traditions which are uh, more radical more, uh, and, and not as widespread as the phenomenon that, that he's particularly interested in, in when he describes, say, the increase in the uh, evangelical. Thank you, and thank you. I want to extend my thanks too, as uh, successor director to uh, Peter Berger at the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs. I want to extend my thanks to everybody for coming uh, to really bear our respects and our honor to Peter. Um, Peter has presented us with a new paradigm for understanding religion in our age, and I have been put in a position I'm not usually put in at Cura which is to provide an anthropological perspective on the approach. Um, any of you in the audience who are familiar with my professional affiliation may note a small irony to the invitation. And it is that I've been a colleague of Peter's at the Institute uh, since 1986, 30 years next year. And therefore, to misuse a phrase that comes up regularly in Peter's book, I'm perhaps more a fitting representative of cognitive contamination then I am a pure anthropological type. Indeed, for almost 30 years, I've danced between the disciplines of sociology and anthropology. And in so doing, I think I've not made almost none of my colleague friends in each discipline happy. Uh, so I bring a perspective to Peter's book that reflects more vernacular tacking, to switch metaphors, than it does a singular or consistent anthropological gaze. But hopefully, my perspective affords me the opportunity to juxtapose uh, Peter's always steadied theoretical excursion, which lies squarely within interpretive sociology, interpretive sociology he helped to create, juxtapose that with cultural anthropology's more chaotic, always more chaotic theoretical parade. So what I want to do today, then, in my remarks is highlight not the whole but those portions of the Berger paradigm that touch on matters where my colleagues in anthropology have, some have also staked some claims and offered insights into how we might understand a religion and plurality, both in earlier times and in relation to the coexistential challenges of our age. Three points of theoretical comparison emerge from this juxtaposition, and I'll just begin by highlighting them. The first has to do with what I regard as the most profound of insights from Peter's new paradigm. Namely, uh, that the most politically 
and ethically consequential features of religion, feature of religion in our late modern age, is not religion's decline, but the globalization of the two pluralisms. My view on this portion of the Berger paradigm is that, the anthro is that anthropological research, and I might say comparative research in religious studies, both confirms and has much to learn uh, from the subtle insights the model offers. The second point that I'll highlight today, and I'll get into the to develop all three momentarily, has to do with what I think is a decidedly secondary part of the paradigm. But it's also a recurring theme in the Berger, Berger model. Namely, I'm referring to the historical chronology and what we might call the phenomenological psychology said to characterize the transition from pre-modern to modern or late modern societies. Here I'll suggest that there's a convincing body of research in anthropology and comparative religious studies uh, that demonstrates that the pre-modern modern binary, which Peter borrows largely from the works of Max Weber, but also Eric Vogelin, very interestingly, and I have more to say about this, uh, that this binary has not stood up particularly well to the test of theoretical time. Just as there are multiple modernities, uh, there were multiple pre-modernities. More specifically, that rather than being the compact worlds of religious certainty that Vogelin, Eric Vogelin imagined, drawing in part on Lucien Levery Brule's ideas, pre-modern societies showed enormously varied degrees of sacred canopying and epistemological consistency. The anthropological qualification on this portion of the par Berger paradigm is, I believe, not at all corrosive of the larger paradigm and its central policy points. But it does, the qualification does result in several interesting adjustments to secondary portions of the paradigm, as well as some adjustments to the policy recommendations. The third and final point I'll highlight today has to do with a portion of the paradigm that builds on and usefully extends, I think very interestingly extends, the arguments of the Viennese phenomenological sociologist Alfred Schutz one of Peter's mentors, and also I might add one of Clifford Goertz's, a gentleman of I knew quite well, um, one of his mentors as well, an anthropologist, Clifford Goertz. Like Goertz, in his famous article on religion as a cultural system, Berger invokes Alfred Schutz to emphasize that human consciousness, reality, is not a single geared mechanism, but multiple in its operational logic, its affective, affective rhythms, and its experiential reality. The Harvard educational, the uh, educational theorist Howard Gardner back in 1983 presented an even more complex variation on this same Schutzian theme. Berger, however, takes this argument much further than these author authors, linking it to the concept of relevant structures. Very interestingly, very important. An idea that he skillfully uses to explain when and how actors shift between different experiential realities and different modalities of cognitive engagement. Drawing on the work of psychological anthropologists, just to do my disciplinary work, uh, like Dan Sperber, Maurice Bloch, and Arthur Kleinman, I have long subscribed to an anthropological variation of this Berger Schutzian theme. My only reservation with regard to the Berger variation on the multiple realities theme is that the qualities of mind to which it refers are best understood, I think, as characteristic of human experience in all ages, not just our own. And Peter knows this. Peter knows this. This is a simple point, but it does encourage a subtle shift in understanding as to just why the experience of the two pluralisms today can be cognitively disquieting and at times politically destabilizing. Peter's two plur pluralisms paradigm suggests that some individuals find the experience of multiple realities so disquieting that they seek to impose an archaic and unitary mindset on a world that no longer allows such experiential homogeneity. Field studies of extremists, including studies that I've done, suggest that most, however, are driven less by the desire to restore a lost certainty, which I'm also suggesting today most pre-moderns didn't have either, than they are in their determination to push aside what they see as inauthentic and alien global institutions. We're right to see extremists like ISIL or Daesh as barbarically immoral. However, like the Nazis that they so strikingly resemble on this point, 
their pathological worldview is not, in the end, entirely mistaken. The extremists have correctly perceived that secular institutions and media, the market, and governance have captured the global high ground, a view that they share, of course, with many level-headed liberal, liberals and religious, religious traditionalists in the West. If I'm right on this point, this qualification on the Berger paradigm, too, has implications, some secondary adjustments to the kinds of formula for peace uh, Peter wishes to offer. So now let me just expand on those really quickly. These are my three themes. Uh, bear with me as I try to unpack them in a little bit more detail. So at the core, point one, at the core of the paradigm is the simple but important insight that the most politically and ethically consequential religious development in modern times is not the old secularization saw of religion's privatization and decline, but the two pluralisms, which Peter defines as, quote, the coexistence of different religions and the coexistence coexistence of religion and secular discourses, end quote. What makes the two pluralisms so sociologically complex is that their coexistence, quote, occurs both in the minds of individuals and in social space. Very important points. As Peter makes clear, neither the new paradigm's rejection of the end of religion thesis nor its highlighting of the ascendance of secular spheres is entirely novel. He makes this very clear. Both points have been the subject of important prior scholarship like scholars like Jose Hazanova, who we invited here, as well as David Martin, earlier as well, Charles Taylor on the imminent frame, and more recently, the psychological anthropologist Tanya Luhrmann on the cognitive leaps between the religious and secular taken by certain evangelicals here in the United States. So the truly novel part of the new paradigm, then, has to do actually more with the second of the two pluralisms than it does religious pluralism per se. Namely, it has to do with the coexistence of secular and religious fields. I quote Peter, modernity has indeed produced a, second, a secular discourse which enables people to deal with many areas of life without reference to any religious definitions of reality. Powerfully, powerfully true. Berger adds an important detail to this insight when he points out that the major difference between his paradigm and the related argument, very similar argument at first, Charles Taylor makes with regard to the imminent frame has to do with the fact that, and I quote Peter, Taylor is a philosopher, and the process he analyzes occurs primarily in the realm of ideas, end quote. What comes next in Peter's statement, and his differentiation from Taylor, in the two pluralisms formulation is the most distinctive, and I think welcome, of contrasts with regards to Berger as opposed to Taylor. He, Peter says, it is important to understand that the course of human events is not primarily a history of ideas, because even as ideas matter and influence events, in the end their plausibility rests on developments that have nothing to do with ideas, but have an affinity, critical term, an affinity with much coarser political and economic interests, end quote. Now, correctly understood, this last argument, which could be understood in many different ways, uh, but knowing Peter, reading the book, this last argument with regard to affinities refers not to a Marxian political economic determination in the last instance, as people used to say in the 70s, but a principle from the socio sociology of knowledge developed first by Alfred Schutz and then extended really quite brilliantly by Berger more than 50 years ago. It has to do in particular with the recognition that ideas and cognitive mindsets set, get their purchase on social actors, not because they are philosophically systematic, as Taylor seems to imply, nor least of all because they are part of an all-powerful Foucaultian discourse, but because relevant structures, what are those? Certain need-creating <coughs> need and frame-confirming circumstances in the larger world make those ideas and mindsets constant with the aspirational projects of great masses of individuals. Peter cites Leon Festinger in this regard. Very good reference. It's an old reference, 1957, but Festinger was in many ways way ahead of his times in thinking about the way in which frames and resonance and relevant structures work. In short, ideas matter when they resonate with the hopes and needs of ordinary people, not as they resonate not because of their intellectual systematicity per se. So on this key point, the Berger paradigm offers the most welcome corrective to certain perspectives in contemporary anthropology and cultural studies on the ethical 
and epistemic challenges of our age. Here I am putting on my anthropological, but a critical of anthropology hat. Anthropologists of secularism, including most notably Talal Assad, whose work in many regards I respect, and I know him personally and respect him greatly, but most anthropologists of secularism have long argued that the pervasiveness of secularism in the modern world is the result of a more or less all controlling Foucaultian, or we would have to if we were being technical about this, young Foucaultian uh, episteme, an episteme that was made in the West and then deployed to capture and colonize hapless co global minds. More specifically, for Assad, secular, secularist discourses have been imposed on a, the global South as well as on religious believers in the West by powerful proponents of modern capitalism in the nation state, the two main carriers of secularism, who saw in public religion an obstacle to their ambitions of capitalist and nationalist hegemony. That's Assad's view. Now, a number of anthropologists, to give a little bit of ground to another anthropology, a number of anthropologists, including John Bowen, and myself, as well as political scientists who work on religious governance, like Al Stepan at Columbia and Jonathan Fox in Israel, have pointed out the, the evidence for this top-down and all-powerful secularist episteme, colonizing global minds, is thin, to put it mildly. The religion state policies that came to predominate in the nations of the modern West are greatly varied, not product of a singular discourse, and not in any say and not in any simple way mutually consistent or public religion unfriendly. As with Anglicanism in the UK and state Lutheran churches in Nordic Eur Europe, as Peter points out, religious establishments or state churches were common across Western Europe in modern times. Germany, Switzerland, and the Low Countries opted for a more pluralistic consociational pattern of religious governance. As of 1905, we know, France was alone among European countries in erecting a high wall of separation between religious and state authorities, and in that regard, it's often compared to the United States. However, unlike the USSR's constitutional wall, the French version allowed extensive state meddling in church affairs, which is a point Peter made this morning. Indeed, as Al Stepan has observed, the wall was designed really to defend the state from religion and religious authorities rather than vice versa. The variation we see in religious governance in the modern West was the result then, not of an all-pervasive and consistent secularist episteme, but of path-dependent and nation-specific struggles over religious governance that resulted in strikingly diverse religion state policies or multiple secularisms, as Al Stepan in a deservedly famous article put it just two years ago. So Berger's paradigm is consistent with all of this, and that's an important point to emphasize. It's consistent with a new body of research that correctly emphasizes that the ascendance of secularist institutions and discourses in modern times is not the result of an epistemic big bang, but of the, quote, and I quote Peter here, the differentiation of reality into multiple relevant structures, end quote. Certainly, as Jose Casanova pointed out in 1994, at times, the differentiation has been helped along by powerful actors with political and economic interests all their own. But the differentiation is also the result of a less elite, far less elite, as Peter again said this morning, and, discor and less discourse-driven event, namely the demonstrated achievements of institutions of scientific, political, and economic nature that resonate with the hopes and needs of billions of people. Now, the prototypical institution, this prototypical secular institution in this regard, uh, in this last regard, and one that Peter and Jonathan Imber have uh, recently explored in a fascinating conference, is the modern hospital with its biomedical epistemology and organization. All around the world, as Peter says in his book, people rush to hospitals when ill, not because their minds have been taken over by secularist epistemes, but because this institution's success rate at dealing with health crises has been good enough to convince many people that biomedical techniques lacking in any religious grounding are more likely than other alternatives uh, to meet certain health needs. Doesn't mean other alternatives are necessarily excluded. It means the biomedical one is taken seriously by many, many people. 
The secular hospital is just one example of the process Berger fittingly describes with reference to the 17th century Dutch jurist, to whom he referred this morn morning, Hugo Grotius, namely that even when, where many of their citizens remain religious, modern societies have allowed the emergence of institutions and social spaces where actors, even religious actors, accept that some, in some spheres of life, it's OK to rely on systems of knowledge and practice that operate, to quote Grotius again, as if God did not exist. Now, classical secularization theory, as we all know, saw the hospital and biomedicine as but the first wave in what would eventually become a tsunami-like secularization process sweeping across the entirety of society, modern society. To its great merit, however, Berger's paradigm reminds us that secularization is real and is important but it's typically domain specific. Rather than secularist homogenization or tsunamis, ours is an age of cognitive and ethical pluralization. Even fervently religious actors learn to move easily through social fields like the Imber Burger Hospital or the International Airport or the Technical University. As Peter points out, not everyone finds these passages easy. At the subjective level, the coexistence of religious and secular zones in modern life obliges actors to engage in what Peter describes as co a cognitive balancing act, learning to, quote, deal with zones of reality without any supernatural presuppositions. But the reality of life in our late modern world is that a surprising number of people manage to make these passages well enough. This brings me to my second point. We're I'm going to qualify, at least suggest that some qualifications to the paradigm might be worthwhile. So it's at this point, with regards to passages between the secular and the religious, that I think the paradigm gets especially interesting. Uh, the juxtaposition of religious and secular pluralities has the potential, the paradigm suggests, to create epistemic and ethical unease among some people. I quote Peter. Pluralism relativizes and thereby undermines many of the certainties by which human beings used to live. Certainty becomes a scarce commodity, end quote. For this portion of the paradigm, bear with me here, Berger relies on one of the most lasting of his early German social theoretical influences, namely Arnold Galen, who lived from 1904 to 1976. The Berger paradigm invokes Galen to propose a philosophical anthropology in which a primary quality of his human nature is that it has a meager repertoire of instincts, quoting Peter, and thus relies on social learning of institutional routines to, quote, provide a program of action that instincts fail to provide, end quote. Galen's view of human nature bears a striking resemblance, I might note, to that of Clifford Gertz in his early work, including to his two introductory essays in the interpretation of cultures, which also, I might add, explicitly cite Schutz. Building on Galen, however, Berger goes further than Goethe, arguing that our biocultural nature reflects a, direct, a, a distinctive social psychology and creates specific epistemological needs. In particular, for most of us, the learning of instinctual behavioral programs allows us to background taken for granted aspects of our social world, thereby freeing us to concentrate on choosing from among an array of foreground options, a choice theme that Peter talked about this morning. But it's precisely here that a tension that looms at the center of Peter's accounts emerges, uh, at least as the two pluralisms paradigm sees it. I quote Peter again, if society were all foreground, we'd have to make new choices every day and social life would come to a grinding halt but the, end quote. But that seems to be what is happening in the parts of the social world we inhabit uh, as they come to be reorganized around the two pluralisms. I quote Peter again. Pluralism greatly helps the expansion of the foreground at the expense of the background. In so doing, it relativizes and undermines many of the certainties by which human beings used to live. Again, certainty becomes a scarce commodity. Now, although he steers clear of any sweeping social determinism, Peter sees this lack of certainty and this excess of foreground choice as a potentially disturbing experience. I quote him again. It seems to me that this is why so many moderns are anxious and why the calm certainty of 
calm certainty of pre-modern societies uh, is attractive and becomes a utopia for a lot of nervous moderns, end quote. One extreme response to this epistemic, epistemic and ethical anxiety, the paradigm concludes, is fundamentalism, which I quote him here, is an effort to restore the threatened certainty, end quote. Put differently, fundamentalism seeks again to bring about an archaic mindset under modern conditions, end quote. As I mentioned a moment ago, this latter assumption as to the certainty deprived nature of some moderns is a decidedly secondary feature of the new paradigm. So please take my evaluation of it accordingly. It has deep roots in Peter's scholarship, however, building on our, the very first book that I ever read by Peter Berger when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Uh, it goes back to a book by Peter Brigitta and Hans Wien Kellner, published in 1973. I'm referring, of course, to there, The Homeless Mind, Modernization and Its Consciousness. Although not central to the two pluralisms paradigm's core diagnosis, the premise does inform some of the political diagnoses and formulas for peace that Peter develops towards the end of the book. Since these are important, and since we were trying to think about the practical implications of the two pluralisms, Bear with me as I spend a few moments on this portion of the model that has to do with the anxiety of choice in modernity. The two pluralisms paradigm thus implies that the ever relativizing circumstance of the modern homeless mind can create a backlash in the form of a longing for certainty that if not neutralized can in turn fuel extremist fundamentalism or nihilistic relativism. The plausibility of this premise depends in part on the social psychological realism of the Berger Galen anthropology of human nature. This model asserts, this portion of the model asserts, that consciousness in pre modern societies was characterized by, again, quote, a very high degree among, of consensus about the basic definitions of reality, end quote. The portrait of pre moderns invoked by the Berger paradigm here was once foundational to classical sociology including Durkheim's views on the collective consciousness in pre-modern societies. Its origins go back in a different way to Lucien levy Brule's 1910 model of the primitive mentality as expressed in How Natives Think. However, Berger's model of pre-modern consciousness relies much more heavily on a more sophisticated version of this argument as, de as developed by the great historian of comparative civilizations, one of my favorite authors, Eric Vogelin, 1901 to 1985. From Vogelin, the paradigm borrows the idea that reality in pre-modern societies is characterized by a thorough compactness. Compactness is the social and epistemic state in which, I'm quoting Peter, religious meanings and rituals are in intertwined with every aspect of human life. What we have come to differentiate as natural and supernatural continuously interpenetrate, end quote. This model of pre-modern consciousness, I would suggest, a small point, uh, hasn't stood up well under the test of time and theoretical research. More than 40 years ago, someone Peter knew, uh, the anthropologist Mary Douglas, no nihilist relativist, but a theologically conservative English Catholic, wrote a brilliant book in which she decried what she called the myth of the pious primitive. And the tendency in modern social theory particularly its Durkheimian variants, to see, to see all pre-modern actors as inhabiting densely religious worlds in which the natural and supernatural are so interwoven that there's little room for uncertainty or agnostic doubt. With her trademark humor and far-ranging comparisons, and they remain brilliant, I think, to this day, Douglas's natural symbols show that many pre-moderns are actually rather cognitively eclectic and religiously indifferent. Indeed, if there is a recurring error in modern Western generalizations about pre-moderns, it's less, as Talal Assad has claimed, a tendency to think religion in terms of Protestant-inspired models of inner belief, I actually don't think we do that all the time, than it is the tendency to assume that everyone in pre-modern societies is religious and the religious perspective is an all-enveloping epistemic and moral canopy. Mary Douglas's mentor, E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, uh, himself a late light convert to Catholicism, I might note, had contributed to what was early 20th century anthropologies. I don't usually stand up for my discipline, but anyway, 
early 20th century anthropology's most, one of its most lasting contributions. The recognition that people in pre-modern or small-scale societies shift between different realities or modes of cognitive processing all the time. No less important, the past two generations have encouraged us to recognize that many pre-modern societies work quite well without having much of a religious canopy at all. Some do, some don't have it such a canopy. 22 years ago in a conference volume I edited and at which Professor Dana Robert was an attendee and contributor, um, the, an anthropologist of China, David K. Jordan, wrote a brilliant article in which he described the traditional pre-contemporary approach to things religious in Chinese civilization. Very interesting. The approach he described was one that was additive, not exclusive in its cosmology. In other words, take from re different religious traditions, whatever works, whatever meets your needs, and don't worry about consistency. It was, so it was additive in, co in a cosmology, largely indifferent to systematization, and above all, not the least inclined to look to a realm as unreliable as the world of spirits to stabilize its cosmology and social ethics. You wouldn't want to go there, not to religion. I would suggest that rather than our myth of the pious primitive, religious conviction in many, not all, but many pre-modern, especially non-monotheistic societies, looked more like the variety Jordan highlights for China. Pragmatic, unsystematic, less concerned with religious rationalization, that requires virtuosos, than with getting along with a healthy mix of theological nonchalance and everyday realism. Now, as I noted in my opening remarks, the at-home or compact mind, the Vogelin portion of the Berger paradigm, occupies a decidedly secondary position in the larger edifice, and the whole stands quite well without it. The reason I've devoted the time that I have to questioning its applicable generalizability, however, is that if we put its assumptions to the side, we also get a better bead on just what type of formulas for peace might be most effective for dealing with the challenge of the twin pluralisms in our age. What exactly do I mean? So this leads me to my third and final set of comments today. The two pluralisms paradigm suggests that in the face of pluralism's relativizations, some fundamentalist actors push back with acts of extremist violence in a vain attempt to restore again that archaic mindset under modern conditions. However, if Levi Brule is wrong, I think the evidence is he was, and modern anthropology and cross-cultural psychology and religious studies are right, and if the archaic mind is little concerned with the psych what the psychological anthropologist Catherine Ewing calls the illusion of wholeness, then one might begin to sus also suspect that today's extremists, and they are real, are engaging in the actions that they do for reasons that perhaps have relatively little to do with epistemic anxiety. Having done several dozen interviews over the years with jihadists in Indonesia, including several who were, in, were involved in supporting the 2002 Bali bombings in which 200 people, mostly Western tourists, were killed, I have to say that I've never been struck by the fact that most had any difficulty moving between religious and secular zones. In terrorism studies, it's a well-known fact that many extremists come from backgrounds in the technical, medical, and engineering sciences. Indeed, it's the mushy social scientists with their relativisms that sort of have problems. Like my Indonesian informants, most of the extremists that we have studied seem quite comfortable participating in multiple zones, including ones like the modern hospital or computer programming centers, where the epistemologies in play come from various imminent frame sciences, to use Taylor's term. The Bali bomber supporters whom I got to know were quite skilled in computer sciences and moved effortlessly between that kind of thought and their religious arguments. Their views on religious matters were, to me, also shockingly banal and instrumental. Take what knowledge you need to get your job done and don't worry about all the rest. In other words, they had a little bit of Chinese Mod, traditional Chinese sort of cosmological eclecticism to them, after all. What struck me about these jihadist guys then, and I've been also reading uh, the documents that Daesh, ISIL, puts online 
to one's great consternation and astonishment. And I'm, I have the same impression. What struck me about these jihadist guys then was not their preoccupation with epistemological certainty, but their perception of everything is ultimately about a zero-sum politics. And that's a little different. They were determined religious warriors, or depending on your v viewpoint, superficial religious hoodlums. And that's how often, that's how they struck me. They, that's what they, as I got to know these guys, some were, I, I developed actually pretty good relations with. Impatient with the tedious erudition of their sober-minded Muslim fellows, and eager to take the fight to apostates, Shia, and Americans. One indirect but revealing measure of my informants ease with at least one small portion of the two pluralisms. They were unfailingly polite with me during our meetings. The bottom line for these guys then was not an anti-modern desire to restore archaic certainties, but a hyper-modern tendency to see everything as political and politics as intrinsically zero-sum. Theirs was an exaggerated version of power is every, a power is everything mentality that is lamentably widespread in our age, including among, of course, many people who are not at all extreme. Bear with me now as, for one more example. Okay, just, I'll, if I may today, and I'll, I'll go much, much shorter tomorrow when I'm supposed to talk about Islam, and I'm sort of wrapped it into one here. Like Germany's National Socialists in the 1930s, Daesh, or ISIL, emerged out of the circumstances of catastrophic political collapse and social humiliation at the hands of perceived civilizational enemies. Consistent with this perception, this fantasy, both the Nazis and ISIL aspired, aspire, to perform, to enact a political order based on spectacular assertions of in-group superiority. That's the driving animus. In-group superiority accompanied by equally spectacular acts of humiliation of the outgroup other. That's what's in play here. In both movements, too, the, the humiliation of the other concludes not with the mere subordination, but the publicly staged degradation followed by final solution, annihilation of that other. There's a social construction of reality here, for sure, but it's more a matter of the construction of social hatred and superiority than it is a concern about cognitive certainty. In this regard, it's again revealing that both the Nazis and Daesh dedicate or dedicated great resources to the vivid theatricalization of power. The fact that its horror is so wantonly amplified, and as with Daesh, sent around the globe to the internet through grisly high-definition videos, offers a clear reminder of their core concern, which is not religious or legal certainty, but the demonstration of hatred triumphant. Now this is awful stuff, I know, not the kind of thing we want to really be celebrating today. So what does any of it have to do with formulas for peace, which is what I really want to end on. My remarks are in broad agreement with, but also suggest a small adjustment to the formulas for peace Peter presents at the end of his fine book. I believe that the paradigm is right to argue that one of the primary challenges to pluralist coexistence today is the rise of various exclusivist extremisms. However, I've also suggested that that, what, that which is animating these movements is not so much epistemological panic as the perceived marginalization and exclusion of some deeply cherished portion of one's dignity and self-identity. I phrased my description of these people just deliberately broadly and neutrally so as to invite all of us to recognize that the phenomenon of which Nazism and Daesh are part is an extreme version of political and moral tensions that in less pathological form are actually pretty widespread in our world. The tensions to which I'm referring here have to do with something of which, however incompletely, Max Weber was deeply cognizant. And I'd like to bring that portion into Peter's two paradigms. Namely, that the modern world is marked by the, quote, rationalization or systematic reorganization of broad swaths of modern society around certain powerful assemblages of social structure and values. As Weber showed, modern capitalism is one of the more powerful of these modern rationalizations, but there are others, including that associated with the modern nation state. 
or that which we see operative on a much smaller scale in the institution of the hospital that Peter and Jonathan have so vividly and I think correctly analyzed. Rationalization involves the systematic reorganization of certain means and schemes in light of a dominant value referent. And by linking values, knowledge, and administrative power in the way it does, rationalization is a peculiarly potent form of modern social change. Its effects reach deep. They're felt everywhere from macro-governmental, macro-government to intimate micro-subjectivity. So what's this have to do with formulas for peace? Sorry, I know this is a little bit long-winded. As Weber knew well, however, much, uh, how, however much it may have once relied on a religious ethic, modern capitalism has had the tendency to press forward into spheres of social life organized at one point around different paramount values, including those of religion and the family, and reorganized those spheres in light of a more exclusively economic ethic. In many parts of the modern world, politics too, think Africa, South Asia, China. Politics too has come to be marked by new forms of political rationalization from the macro to the micro, often based on a more generalized and abstract politics of the nation state or the party or some other sodality or political allegiance. Of course, there's nothing wrong with either of these value and orders rationalizations. Modern capitalism's economic rationalizations have resulted in great increases in productivity, prosperity, and social efficiency. In many countries, too, nation-state politics has resulted in more inclusive rather than exclusive forms of political participation. However, as Weber correctly sensed, economic and political rationalization like these may be deeply disquieting for those in society who aspire, for whatever reason, to some alternative value system and alternative value rationalization of society. For those who do, not, who do feel estranged or marginalized from the hegemonic rationalizations transforming our world, and they are, the very pervasiveness of the change, its systematicity and rationalizing power may well inspire the formation of alternate, alternate ethical imaginaries that mimic the dominant rationalizations, even while displacing those rationalizations, core values, and authorities. Most such alterities need not be an extremist in any form. As with Christian democracy, a tradition I respect enormously and in many ways identify with to this day, as with Christian democracy in late 19th century Europe, moderate Islamism in contemporary Tunisia or Indonesia, or the various green parties in Europe, most of these alternate rationalization soon resign themselves to making system accommodating reforms to the established socio-political order with its other rationality. But not all proponents of alternate rationalizations will be happy with such half measures or measures that focus on reforming the individual heart rather than remaking the whole of state and society. A few more totalizing counter-rationalists will dream of storming the commanding heights of the state and using its technologies to force changes on the whole of a reluctant society. So is there a formula for peace here or just another description of contemporary despair? Rather than finding ways to get backward looking people to live with the reality of the two pluralisms, I've suggested today that the most serious challenge is to get global institutions and exchanges going that convince the great majority of people that they too stand to benefit from and have a vested interest in or stake in some significant portion of the new global order. Although today I have taken, at times taken exception to some of Charles Taylor's prognoses, my formula for peace actually shares much in common with recommendations he's made over the years, beginning with his multiculturalism book, what was it, 30 years ago? and more recently in his very, very helpful interventions in Quebecois politics, which bear reading. Uh, so my recommendations actually draw rather heavily on his suggestions with regard to the politics of recognition, his phrase. Taylor suggests that the challenge of coexistence in a pluralist age is getting people to feel that they are recognized as players, partners, and citizens in various collective social endeavors, even where social inequality is inevitable and rampant. The recognition is as much moral and affective, indeed it's more that, 
as it is economic or electoral. In the case of the contemporary Muslim world, my last case, my last comments, the evidence is that in those countries where markets worked well enough, modern education, including especially for women, was progressing, and government had at least a, a measure of representativeness with regard to major groupings in civil society, those who would appeal to a, two pluralisms denying totalitarianism of an Islamist sort have actually had few buyers. There are few shining democracies among them, hear me correctly, but Indonesia, Malaysia, yes, even Turkey, Morocco, Jordan, and Senegal, uh, these Muslim-majority countries are, for the most part, countries that are putting together a politics of recognition that's close to working. If my formula for peace sounds rather old-fashioned, that's because it is, at least in a politics of recognition way. It's at least 30 years old. Yes, we have to be attentive to the distinctive ways in which different religious and normative traditions engage the two pluralisms, but we have to work above all to make people feel that they have a stake in the larger ways of life, especially moral ways of life different peoples have created living in a world of two pluralisms. You might ask, isn't building stakeholder societies a hopelessly long-term formula for peace? It is. And the great wars of the 19th and 20th century West show that it's not easy, its challenge never ends, and it will encounter sometimes horrifically violent setbacks, as it is today in the Middle East. In the meantime, particularly where the politics of recognition is not yet secure, we may have to take more immediate measures. These include putting in place institutions for the defense of this civic pluralist way of life against, and for the moment they seem many, against those who seem determined to bring the entire pluralist to a two pluralist edifice down. But there's the two pluralisms rub. We will do so, we will put those defensives in place more effectively if we recognize that our battle is not just our own, and that there are many people from diverse faiths, not least the great majority of Muslims, who want us to finally recognize that our fight is also theirs. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over. Good. Please.